everybody. I'm Janelle Moore, and this is I Got More. And today we are talking about the NBA dark horses as we reboot and the snitch line. And I have three people to chop it up with me. You are. Oh, I'll go first. I'm Amber Vickers from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, and I'm representing the Oklahoma City Thunder. All right. Who's oh, you're that? pointing at me. <laughs> we got this. We are so smooth. Uh, so my name is Tara, and um, I'm here in Portland, Oregon. I am a Blazer fan, but I'm also a fan of a whole lot of teams of the NBA. So I'm so thanks for having me on, Janelle. No problem. Hey, hey Janelle, Leo, uh, host of the Latinx POV podcast. Um, a Miami Heat fan, but a fan of the NBA altogether. So uh, love this conversation. Looking forward to it. All right. I am excited. This is my first episode, and I'm excited to be with Five Reasons. And, you know, I've been writing for SB Nation for about three seasons, and it's just been a process. I've been writing just about for everybody under the sun, and right now I just – and I hate to toot my own horn, but it's a poor frog that don't praise his own pond. But I feel like I'm the hardest working woman in sports media today. Uh, so I'm just doing just just about everything. But enough about me. Let's let's get to toot this toot. conversation. Uh, <laughs> toot that horn. Toot that horn. <laughs> yeah, you do it. Well, it's You're it's not bragging if it's fat, and th that's just it. I I just got to keep hustling. Yes, I agree. So the NBA will be starting on July the 30th, of course, about like maybe a, a week and a couple of days away. And it's same as it ever was. It's all about the favorites. But right now we're talking about the dark horses, the teams that can make the most noise. Because remember, there's no home court advantage. Ain't no fans. I don't care how many floors they bring into Orlando. It's still no home court advantage because it's the fans who makes the home court advantage. So it's an even playing field for everybody. And I feel like whoever is the hottest team will make the most noise. And there's a lot of upsets on the way. And I'm flanked by the Oklahoma City Thunder, the Miami Heat, and the Blazers. And they all have a awesome shot of making some noise. So... I'll start with Portland. So Tara, what makes the Blazers dangerous in the Western Conference? So um, the Blazers didn't do any themselves any favor this year by starting off in a pretty deep hole. Uh, it wasn't entirely their fault. They knew going into the season they weren't going to have center use of Nurkic. They didn't know three days into the season they were going to lose Zach Collins. And then a month later, they were going to lose Rodney Hood. So um, the way the Blazers usually do is that they continually outperform their expectations. And this year was different. Um, every time they could have got some momentum, they like kind of stalled out. And so where they come into the bubble right now is like three and a half games behind. However, those of us in Portland cannot wait. I can't tell you how I can't can't tell you how excited we are to see Yusuf Nurkic return. He was supposed to come back the very next game before the season ended. And we were ready. Like we all have our, the beast is back t-shirts. We are like so ready to have Yusuf Nurkic back. Um, so obviously that didn't happen, but Yusuf Nurkic, Zach Collins, um, they're the two best uh, people in the front court. And the Blazers have been without them all year. And Yusuf Nurkic is like a t wonderful partner for Damian Lillard when it comes to the pick and roll. Like I just close my eyes and I think about him just like rolling like a giant bear down the lane. And he's not, Damian Lillard has not had that kind of help all year long. We haven't had a center who could pass and make plays. We haven't had an aggressive defender like Zach Collins has showed that he has been. So the Blazers are going to be coming into the bubble with totally rejuvenated with two of their really, really important players coming back. And I think that's going to be a big difference maker for them. Okay, moving on to the Eastern Conference. 
and the heat has surprised a lot of people this season and it's a shame that a lot of these pundits aren't putting respect on their name fourth in the eastern conference and their home record is is just amazing leo what makes the heat dangerous in your opinion the bench i mean the the heat starting five we have we have, i think we have great chemistry first of all uh, as a squad but the, the the bench is what really makes a difference we can bring a guy like dragic off the bench you know put up points assist control the tempo of the game i think that really helps us out where the miami heat struggle and we've struggled for a long time is in the third quarter we cannot let leads get away from us and we need to continue playing well and hard going into the fourth quarter uh, this year, I was frustrated watching many games, uh, seeing leads that we had built up uh, at the half uh, disappear in the third quarter, only to have to try to fight back in the fourth quarter to get a win. Uh, so, in, for my opinion, in, in my opinion, the Miami Heat needs to work on that. Of course, we had a couple injuries, things like that, didn't have those uh, most steady lineups. So, I think the time off really helped uh, some of our guys. But, you know, we got dog mentalities. We got dogs on the squad. So, you know, Jimmy Butler, I think, kind of brings that to the team, too. He brings that mentality. He fits in with Heat culture, and I think that we're going to see a really big difference in the Miami Heat this year. Yeah, and especially you have an acquisition in Andre Iguodala. He's a veteran presence who can um, stabilize the second unit, and you could throw different lineups here and there, especially on defense. So. Jay Crowder yeah. too. You know, Jay everybody Crowder. was talk, every, everybody was talking about the Iggy trade, but we got Jay Crowder also. He came in just knocking down threes for us. Uh, so it was it was a really big help that at a time where we had lost Hero for a bit. Uh, you know, our our, our rookie uh, standout who was playing really well up until the injury. Uh, so we have him coming back, Duncan Robinson. You know, smashing down threes. So. I, I think we're going to have a good squad. You know, Bam, Kendrick Nunn, we, we have a tight little group there. Yes, you do. And pivoting back to the Western Conference, a lot of people didn't give OKC a chance to make noise this season, but you guys did. Chris Paul mentoring uh, Shai Gilbert, Alexander, and you guys are right in the mix of it. What you think about that, Amber? I love what they dangerous. I love what OKC has done this year. I actually picked Portland to get that eighth seed, and Miami's my dark horse in the East, so we have something in common there. <laughs> Oklahoma City's bench is their biggest issue, and I'll give you some inside information on what OKC might be missing from the bench. Uh, Dennis Schroeder, which is my sixth man of the year, will probably be missing for the first series because his wife – is going to have a second child. So uh, Terrence yeah. Ferguson is um, needs to step up and looks like we might have Roberson coming back. He's been practicing every day with the team and things like that. So he's our anchor on defense. So when he comes back, if he's able to come back healthy, we're still missing that offense. So somebody's going to have to step up out of one of our young guys. I think it could be Darius Baisley. He's a rookie. I think it could be him. I also think that Terrence Ferguson needs to get his confidence back. Steven Adams is going to have to put up some better numbers. Of course, Chris Paul is going to do his thing. He will up his numbers. Uh, SGA will up, up his numbers. And Gallo will up his numbers as well. So Billy Donovan is going to have to shuffle those lineups a little bit for Oklahoma City to kind of figure it out without Dennis Schroeder because that's 20 points off the bench. And also Schroeder closes for us. So that five, Gallo, SGA, Schroeder, Adams and CP3, there's our closers. So now we're going to have to plug somebody in to close, and it's probably going to be Roberson. So he's going to have to have some sets where Stephen Adams is running it. He's going to be that big on that pinch post, and he's going to have to pass and cut because Roberson's not a shooter. He's a slasher. He's a slasher, and he plays defense. So long as Billy Donovan kind of shows Roberson's offense in a different way, I think Oklahoma City will be fine. But I'm worried about our bench because Dennis Schroeder is our bench. And we have those young guys, Gallo, I mean, uh, Diallo, excuse me. We have uh, Bays off the bench and Ferguson's coming off the bench. And of course, Dort starts. So if Roberson's able to go, able to start, you move Dort to the bench. 
it's just going to be it's going to be very interesting to see. I'm very excited for this team. ESPN picked us 13th, I think, in the West. They gave us like a 0.3 chance of making the playoffs. Yeah, it was bad. The predictions were were bad. But I'm excited to see this team play. Chris Paul, SGA, I trust those two guys. Steven Adams, he's been there before. SGA had his coming out party last year against the Warriors. So I'm really excited to see what OKC does. He sure did. I, I remember that series with Golden State and the Clippers. SGA really surprised some people. And with Chris Paul being as a mentor, he's really getting getting better and, and getting confidence. And even though CP3 isn't one of my favorite players, but I give credit where it's due. He, he is a solid leader and you know, a solid mentor. He's mentored more than uh, SGA, but that's another show for another day. As far as the youth movement goes, I'll go back to Portland. You know, you got you have Nasir Little, Anthony Simmons, um, Gary how, Trent how, Jr. How, how they, how, how He's my fave. Yeah, how you think that would do in this type of atmosphere with the intensity being? Um, up a notch. So uh, Gary and Anthony and even Naz, um, they all got a lot of playing time. I mean, we were so depleted this season that there was a time where Anthony Tolliver and Scal of ECA were starting. Like, <laughs> you're like, who? Right? So it was, um, it was, it, it gave our younger players more opportunity to play than they usually get in Portland. Usually there's like, you sit on the bench all your first year, your second year, you may get a chance to play a little bit. And it's not until your third year that you really get to see the court. And that all got through, got through and thrown out the window. So uh, Anthony and Gary are solid, like towards the end of the season, um, Gary, they were running plays for Gary that were kind of similar to some of the plays that they would run for Mo Harkless when he was there. Um, Gary's able to get his own shot. He can get to the basket. Um, Anthony, they had really high expectations for him going into the year. They thought that he was going to be controlling the ball a lot and running that second um, offense. And uh, there was just a lot for him to have to do. And so it took him a while to get in. But um, I think our our young guys are really well set up just because of how much they got to play already this season. Okay, so Leo, what about your young guys? What about Kendrick Nunn and Tyler Hero? How do you think they'll do in an uh, uh, intense atmosphere like the playoffs? Yeah, Hero, I I'm interested to see about Hero. Like I said, he was coming back from the injury. He was just about to get back uh, to playing ball when, when, when we had to stop uh, everything. So I'm really curious to see how he handles it. Um, you know, we have another young guy in Duncan Robinson who can hit the three. Uh, and then we also have key bench players. Uh, and I hope that we can find minutes for him. We have energy guys like Chris Silva. You know, for me, you know, seeing Chris Silva early on in the season kind of come off the bench and give that push, that hustle, I, I think was big. I don't know how Spolstra is going to use them. We have so much talent and such a deep bench that it's really going to show Spolstra's coaching. Um, what's the word that I'm looking for? His talent, uh, because people have always kind of knocked him, and I think he's underappreciated, such as Billy Donovan. Uh, you know, I didn't think Billy Donovan was going to do as good of a job in OKC as he's doing coming from Florida. So, you know, these are two underrated coaches, and I'm, you know, and it's not a surprise that we're talking about both their teams. Cool. All right. Um, back to OKC. What What do you think is one of the X factors? You know, as you go into the postseason, I know you that you mentioned the bench, but what is the X factor that you think will get you over the hump or help you make some upsets? I think it's going to be Stephen Adams, and a lot of people probably will pick. Maybe Steven Adams, maybe they might go a young guy in Darius Baisley. He's coming back from injury. Sammy points he can give OKC. But Steven Adams, if he could average a double-double for OKC, I think that would bode well for us. Like I said, OKC might be mission Schroeder for a little bit. So whenever his wife has the baby, he has to go. He said he's going to leave, and there's no telling when he's going to come back. So Steven Adams can get us about 12 or 13 points a game. 
and about 10 rebounds a game, I would be happy with that because that means that his production is up from the season and everybody's production is going to have to be up from the season in order for OKC to be successful and also to make up for that scoring that Dennis Schroeder is not bringing off the bench. And I also want to see if Darius Baisley can show more of that confidence on offense. He's shown confidence on defense, but when Chris Paul passes him the ball, he kind of gets stuck a little bit sometimes. And I want to see if that confidence can come out of him and see if he can be more productive on the offensive end off the bench for us. Okay. For Portman, what are your X factors, uh, Tara? Um, well, like we're all holding our breath that Yusuf Nurkic, when he comes back, is a uh, is the use of Nurkic who he was when he went down. And we know that that's asking a lot. He had a really horrific injury. I was there when it happened. It was absolutely devastating. And we, we saw what happened with Paul George when he had the similar injury. It took him quite a while to work his way back in. So I think the X factor is how, uh, how big of an impact use of Nurkic makes game one. And like, just like, like I said, the thing that we were waiting for was just like the the feeling of Yusuf Nurkic coming back into the arena and how much, you know, the fans are just adore him. And, um, you know, he's going to have to do that in an empty arena now when he comes back to play the first time. So if he can be close to, you know, who he was, the way he creates space for Damian Lord, the way that he uh, creates plays on his own. He just, he has this great attitude of like no one's messing with him or his boys. Um, so I think Yusuf Nurkic, if he is ready to go out the gate, then the Blazers will do really well. Okay, for the Heat, what are your X factors? Well, I, actually, I just had a question for Tara. We haven't spoken about Skinny Mellow. You know, oh, what's up with Skinny boy. Mellow? That's you my know, boy. What you, what? I prefer to call him oh. Bubble Mellow. Um, and if, if I may, I was totally unprepared for the impact that Mello was going to have on Portland. Like we, like all of the, you know, the talking, so many of the talking heads were like, oh, this is just a desperation move by Portland. And yeah, it was, but from the moment he got here, Mello has been a great teammate. He has been generous. He's been kind and he's been gracious and he's played hard and he plays like a guy who's been playing for 16 years. Like he knows. And, you know, you know, bubble mellow. I think he's going to be going sliding back to the three um, because, you know, not having Trevor Ariza. So um, I'm excited that it could be like, I mean, I remember when I was 36, I thought I was a lot more youthful than I was. That was a time where I went on a diet and was in really great shape. So, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe B Bubble Mellow could be really important as an X factor in Portland too. Thank you for asking. <laughs> What's the X factors for the heat? Uh, to, uh, to be honest with you, I think one of the X factors for the heat is going to be the play of uh, Kendrick Nunn. Um, he, in my opinion, the first couple of months, he was up there with some of the other rookies. Um, and, and I think his style of play is going to fit in well with what the team's looking to do, uh, kind of, kind of pushing the ball, leading the team. Uh, I, I just want to see if, if we can get a little bit more scoring out of Jimmy. Um, you know, we, we have Bam over there who, who's a great defender, a great rebounder, and he can put up points himself. But what I haven't seen from the Miami Heat this year is that steady guy who's going to take that shot, you know, who's going to say, I'm going to – and we all know it's Jimmy. We all we all know that it's Jimmy when it comes down to it. But I, – and, 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 I, and I, don't get me wrong, I love Jimmy Butler on this team. But that's the one thing that I've always said. It's like, man, is, it, is this a guy who I think can get me 30 every night of a playoff series. I don't know. And we're going to see this year. Oh, that, that's song. That's song right there. Um, as far as matchups, who, who do you guys want? Ooh, I can who tell you who you I don't want. want. I can tell you who I don't want. And, and oh. you know, this, this was a dark horse that I, that I kind of had. Um, and, and that's Philly. I mean, Philly was out of the top five in the East, right? 
So people people aren't really talking about Philly much, and I think that move uh, of Ben Simmons to the power forward, I think that's going to be problems for some teams. Now, I don't know how he's going to adjust because he's one of these players that likes to have the ball in his hand, but I, I, for the Miami Heat, the you know, Joel Embiid, stuff like that, he's always kind of giving us problems. So, you know, that's, that's one team that, that kind of worries me. Well, who don't worry you? Ooh. Um, hmm. Wow. Okay. You know what? I wouldn't mind taking on the Brooklyn Nets. You know, Dinwiddie was sitting there popping off, you know, on, on a on a pop, <laughs> podcast or something like that, saying that, you know, watch out for the Nets. The Nets are coming. Yeah, we'll take them on. You know, I think I think the Miami Heat will take them on first round. We got them. How He's many players always, do they have? <laughs> running off at the mouth. And he ain't no KD, ain't no Kyrie. They they um got uh Crawford, and we don't know how much game he has left. He's been out of the league for a minute. He just turned 40, but you know, we'll see. Even Spencer's out too with uh COVID. Wilson so Chandler's we'll, out. We'll, yeah, they're yeah. they're missing a lot of people. <laughs> they're, they're they, they brought of- they- they brought in Beasley and he left like the next day or something like that. I don't know. I don't know what's going to Yeah. He, he yeah. got it too. Uh, for Portman, who do, who do you want to face? Who? What matchup do you want to face? Well, I want the Portland Trailblazers to take on the Los Angeles Lakers. I oh. mean, <laughs> might as well go for it, right? <laughs> right. I mean, I mean they, I mean, they have, like I said, they have a big enough hole that to crawl out of. Might as well go for it. Yeah, and plus, remember that that game, that first game, like when Kobe first passed away, and there was Portland won, and Rachel Nichols had the gall to ask Damian Lillard if he felt bad for winning. <laughs> yeah, I um, see the TV and just. I don't know. I mean that that was that was the most stupidest question I have ever heard. I that, actually partly part of the reason I want, want to take on the like the Blazers to take on the Lakers is because Damian Lillard owes Anthony Davis one. Like the Blazers need to exercise that demon um from the Pelicans defeat a couple years ago and I would love it. To be against Anthony Davis, no. That's right, because, it. because Portland was swept by uh, by New Orleans that year. Plus, not only AD but Rondo. Mm-hmm. Rondo yeah. is a, a Laker, so yeah. Thanks for bringing yeah. that up. <laughs> what about the um, OKC? Because I'm really, I actually, when I was at, when I was thinking about dark horses, I thought OKC and Miami were the two teams that I was most interested in outside um, of the Blazers, and I'm also really interested in the Grizzlies. But who do you think OKC uh, you like? Like, who are they even matched up against right now? Houston? <gasps> no, uh, not Houston. Not yet. Oh no. Because that would be so good. <laughs> well, right now it's Utah, but I think I think Ugh. Houston will get the fourth seed. I think OKC is staying the fifth seed. I think the two LA teams. I don't want OKC to, to see those, but other any other teams, I'll take the Mavs, which I don't think is a lot of people are high on the Mavs. I don't see it. The Mavs, I'll take on the Mavs, Houston, Utah, even Denver, but I don't think we're going to slip to that sixth seed. I think Utah might slip to the seven. They don't have Bogdanovich. We don't know what Conley's confidence and his health is like. Uh, I think the Mavs can get that six seed. I think Denver might stay three. And I think that the two L.A. teams will stay where they're at. But I don't want to see either L.A. team. As long as we don't play, as long as OKC doesn't play the Clippers or the Lakers, I'm fine because the matchups just are horrible. But any Mm -hmm. other team, OKC, I'm, I'm rolling with OKC on that one. Chances of a dark horse getting to the conference finals or the finals? Anyone? I think it's a great chance because, like I said, you know, it depends on who gets hot. You know, the, the favorites, you know, I'm not, re- and it's crazy to say I'm not really high on them. It just seems like I smell upsets. I smell a bunch of upsets, to be quite honest with you. You know, anything can happen. You know, mm-hmm. like I said, it depends on who gets hot, who has that momentum, especially coming off of those uh, seeding games, you know. 
So it could be anybody. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if a dark horse team reaches the conference or the NBA finals. It'll be just what this season deserves because this has been a weird year. And, you know, the season, the season is just weird as well. So it's just, just what we deserve. You know what I mean? Yeah, Janelle, I was thinking as Tara was talking about wanting to face the Lakers, what came to my mind was 1999, you know, the lockout season. Mm -hmm. And when when, when it was that shortened season, we had, I mean, I'm still heartbroken by game five, you know, Miami Heat versus the Knicks, you know, number one seed, number eight seed, and they took us out and they ran all the way to the finals. They ended up losing to the Spurs in the end, but it was a number eight seed that got to the finals. So it, it, in these kind of shortened seasons, um, or, or this is the first time where I think they've had a, a work stoppage for such a long period of time and having to come back to it. So I'll, I'll be interested to see if any of these uh, lower seeded teams can get out of there. Because traditionally over the last couple of years, we've seen it, you know, kind of be, all right, the number one seed, the number two seed. I'm trying to think back to a team where it was like, boom, they came out of nowhere and got to the finals. Cool. I, I agree because I think in the East, a lot of people are sleeping on Toronto. And I honestly think that Toronto could beat yeah. Milwaukee. I don't think Milwaukee wants to see Toronto in a seven-game series. I just don't. So the game slows down. Nick Nurse knows how to play Giannis. Yes, you don't have Kawhi. Yes, you don't have Danny Green. But Siakam has stepped up. Uh, Fred, Fred Van Fleet has stepped up. Kyle Lowry seems to get over his playoff issues. Um, you have Norman Powell, which can get hot at any moment. Terrence Davis is really good. So I think Toronto has a really good shot at making the finals. And I mean, speaking of this, Miami laid the blueprint on how to guard Giannis. Yeah. Bam, yeah. Bam had Giannis in jail that last game that they had, like a couple weeks before work stoppage. Mm-hmm. They were playing in Miami, and, you know, they were doubling and tripling Giannis, but uh, once Spo switched Bam on him, I think they, they, they guard, it, it was it was a thing of beauty. I think they held them to 11 points, but we also got to remember the game was in Miami. And anytime a game is in Miami, it comes with distractions. I cannot speak to Giannis being out on South <laughs> Beach or partying or anything like that. I will not say that. But there's always that temptation there. And in the bubble, we're not going to have that. So the Miami Heat won't have that advantage of someone coming into our house and wanting to play in our background, in our in our playground. I remember clear as day, Zach Collins turned 21 in Miami. And the next, I'm not saying I know anything about anything that happened, but the next day he was interviewed and his color was not great. He was, <laughs> I, I think that I think they had some fun the night before, or, you know, maybe he just had the flu. I don't know, but uh, yeah, I think that's a really interesting point that now that's not going to be an issue anymore. The South think, beach flu is real. The South beach flu yes, is real. Is. Yes, I think, I think everybody will be focused though, because you don't have a choice, but to be focused. I mean, what are you going out there to play? Yeah. Shuffleboard, playing, you tossing the bags in the hole. I don't know what that's called. Excuse me. You're going fishing. Everybody is focused. You're getting your zing in. You know, everybody is pretty much focused. You're playing video games. The focus is there. You don't have that outside distraction, even though they were trying to get some outside distractions, but you didn't hear that from me. <laughs> you don't have any outside <laughs> distraction. So everybody's pretty much focused, locked in. We know LeBron goes zero dark 30 during playoffs anyway. So I like the focus of these players. And now we will see what the layoff has done to these players. Jokic, he looks good. The Joker, he looks really good. He looks very slim. A lot of these players look slim. James Harden looks slim. Kyle Lowry's lost some weight. Marcus Saul's lost some weight. So I'm eager to see what this Kyle weight loss. Yeah. Yeah. What this weight loss kind of does for these players. But the focus will be there because you're focused. You got eight games. They're basically, you're basically starting the playoffs because you're trying to get that seeding trying to figure that out, then you bring that momentum into a playoff series and you've been off for, what, almost four months pretty much. So you need to refocus and retool, and I think these guys are doing that right now. So I think the bubble was a good idea. I was against it at first. But we had zero positive COVID tests, so now I'm like, okay, I'm ready. I'm excited for the scrimmages tomorrow, and I just can't wait. And speaking of which, you know, zero positive tests um, recently and, you know, 
we have something called the snitch line. Now, me personally, you know, it's it's a good. I think you know it's it's kind of a thin line, and it's ironic in a way because you when you think that these people, these guys, they tough, you know, they they talk trash, they pull up, but you know, why can they not have the same energy on the court, off the court, and say, hey, you know, you what's wrong with you? You ain't got your mask on. You better put your mask on. I mean, you know what I mean. Why, why have a snitch line? What, what y'all think? I mean, why have it? I, I think, I think we've seen why have it, right? Uh, yeah. I, I think it's important. the 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 NBA wants to maintain the integrity of the bubble, right? And I, I think that's critical if they want this to be a success. And let's be honest, they're not doing it to entertain America. They got millions of dollars on the line. And I'm talking about TV money. You know, it's TV money. They have money on the line. So if they want to put their product out there for everybody to watch, they need to maintain the integrity of the bubble. Now, God, you know, players are going to be players. They, they, want to, they want a certain sense of freedom. You know, they, they want to still be able to get some of the things that from the outside world that they're not able to get in the bubble. But I, I think you're right. The snitch line, I don't know. People, players should have their masks on, but we've seen players in some videos and stuff like that. They're walking around without them. We see the staff at the hotels. They all have their masks on. So we know that in this pandemic, it's recommended that both parties wear masks in order for us not to be able to spread anything. Come on, fellas, just wear the mask. Yeah, my thing is that they can abuse that snitch line. You know, that's... That's what I'm getting at. The temptation to abuse the snitch line, just calling it just for fr frivolous stuff, <laughs> stuff that you know, just to be petty, and maybe to try to get some competitive edge. It's definitely good for jokes, and like we are so thirsty for jokes right now that like it's almost worth it. I think just for like us to have something that we can laugh about. But like the this whole bubble situation uh, reminds me a lot of summer camp, right? Like ev you know everybody's staying in dorms and they're like you know learning new skills and they're playing together with their teams and but they don't have like head counselors here. So they need to have like somebody to go to. Like if they, I mean, seriously, if they do see something egregious, they need to know where to go. And I guess they could go to their coaches, but do you really want to put the coaches into that, you know, position? Um, they could go to the players union, but the players union are players who are playing. So they're not really the people that you would want to go and to if you did see is something. A, is it known uh, as a habitual tattletale. So yes, I know, well, Paul is. And yes, that is. is why I, I think that the Oklahoma, the Oklahoma City is a really good candidate for a dark horse because Chris Paul did not do all of this work to make this whole thing happen to go home after the first <laughs> round. I agree. And he, he actually won us a basketball game because a guy came in with his jersey untucked mm -hmm. and he won us the game. So, you know, you got to know the rules. He knows the rule book in and out. And I love it. He's one of my favorite <laughs> players to watch. But I love Chris Paul. I love him knowing the rules. And he just knows what to do. Now, the snitch line. Oh, boy. You have a bunch of grown kids. Like LeBron is a big kid. LeBron said to himself, I'm a big kid. But I don't think LeBron's going to be calling the snitch line. I just don't see that. People like Dwight Howard, maybe Chris Paul, you know, people like that that can be petty at times, I think would do something like that. But the Chris guys that are the guys that are Chris, focused. <laughs> he he kicked Steph Curry off the court. I think it was last year. And it backfired. Yeah, he, he is that petty. Yeah. Oh, he uh, won. I think it was like the opening game a couple seasons ago. Like somebody filled out the card wrong and and put CJ McCollum's name in the wrong place, and so CJ McCollum couldn't play. They made they had to make him go back to the locker room and change his clothes and put his street clothes on because Chris Paul <laughs> got it. Yeah, I've I've not been a fan of Chris Paul except, but I like him on OKC. Like so, like I'm. You know, con considering what happened in the playoffs last year between Portland and OKC, I love what OKC has done. Like, yes. I think I'm super excited 
Like in Portland, they're like, oh, you know, Portland, you know, blew up OKC. And I'm like, yeah, that's working out really well for them. So let's just <laughs> with that narrative. Yeah, you know, like, so I'm happy about that. You know, it's funny when so, someone mentioned petty. And that's the word that Rudy Gobert used. And I don't know about you ladies, but I'm thinking to myself, I don't want to hear from Gobert for the rest of the 2020 season. You know, him, him touching the microphones. I was like, hey, bro, shh. You know, don't, don't just just don't speak on the subject. Just keep walking. Say, I got no comment. So it, it, it was one of those things. And Dwight Howard, Dwight Howard was complaining that someone snitched on him. I'm sorry, Dwayne. Mm -hmm. I think you snitched on yourself because you got like three, <laughs> four, five videos out there walking around the compound with no mask on. So, mm -hmm. I mean, if you're putting it out there for public consumption of you not wearing a mask, it's going to catch people's attention. Come on. You know what I'm it, You know what I'm interested in seeing? You mentioned Rudy Gobert. He and Donovan Mitchell are not getting along, and I want to see how that chemistry is going to affect them in these oh. eight games and in this playoffs. They just don't get a I, – I don't know what happened – what transpired, maybe Donovan knew about him having coronavirus because this virus, from what I've been told, they have known about it. The NBA has known about it. So how does that affect Utah's chemistry in the playoffs? Because they need that chemistry because Bogdanovich, missing Bogdanovich is huge for them. Yeah, I think – I think the beef between Mitchell and Gobert has been simmering way before Corona. And mm -hmm. it just seems like um, Rudy is jealous of Donovan. And, you know, Donovan seems to be the, the face of the franchise. And it, maybe Rudy feels some type of way. And, you know, he, he, want, he wants that attention. You see how he was touching the mask and, I mean, touching the microphones and all and making light of this. He's, he was doing that just for attention. And he ended up giving um, – given Donovan COVID. And there was even a theory that, you know, Rudy was the fall guy for the whole COVID thing anyway. They thinking that, you know, he, he might have got it from one of the Celtics. And this one of the Celtics players had like flu-like symptoms when, you know, they, they were facing Utah and one of them was out, but they didn't think to test for COVID. Steph was the first NBA player that was tested for COVID. It turned out he had the flu, but, you know, Utah tested Rudy and, you know, here we are. I mean, they were coming out of that part of the season. This happens every, there every year. There's this part of the season where they all get sick. You know that they were on a long plane ride together. Everybody picked it up. And then one by one, they have to take a game or two off, you know, because they have flu-like like symptoms. I mean, Gary Trent Jr. on his 21st birthday was actually playing in a game and he had to like go to the hospital or he had to get like fluids after the game because he was like so sick. And um, it just, you know, it, it was hard to know that it was like a different something that, you know, was hitting him because they get it every year. It was flu season also. Yeah. You know, like, that's it, what, it, yeah. It, that's what yeah. I mean. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. it, it was flu season. So I, I totally get it. You know, it, they didn't think anything about it, but, Still, when they started talking about the COVID stuff, and I remember being at a game probably the day before or two days before they shut everything down and thinking to myself, should I be here? You know, because it was just starting to pick up. And then mm -hmm. the following night, the NBA said, mm, we're done. That was a good move by the NBA. I'm glad they reacted quickly. They let yes. the Mavs finish their game, but they didn't let the Pelicans play that game, that next game. And the Mavs didn't know if they were going to come out at halftime or not. Like, they were in the locker room like, what's going on? We don't know if we're coming out. I was actually streaming that OKC game, getting ready to broadcast it when it happened. Oh, so wow. I was like, what is going on? And Chris Paul, you know, he's trying to find out what's going on. He's head of the Players Union. He's trying to find <laughs> out what's going on. And everybody was like, what's going on? And then they announced that, you know, everybody go home. They're not going to play a game tonight. So I was like, man, what, what really happened? And we had no clue. Like there was no clue. And then the NCAA called heave to it and they, they took action. It took them a little longer. They let them play some conference championship games because I actually streamed some of that material as well. The NCAA let them play a little bit and then they were like, okay, you know, if the NBA is not playing, then you shouldn't be playing either. I don't care how big of a money grab it is. You shouldn't be playing either. Don't put these kids at risk for playing for free. But that's another subject for another day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, it sure is. Uh, any parting shots before we, we close out? 
we we can't we can't get off the snitch line without talking about Spencer Dinwiddie's comments. Come on, let's be honest. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So 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 you know, I, I loved his I loved his advice. Don't call the snitch line. Uh, don't cross the line to get Postmates. Those are two very important. You know, don't cross the line to get Postmates is important. But then don't fly out L.A. work. And I was like, wow, okay. Don't fly. Don't fly L.A. workout. That's what he said. Don't fly L.A. workout. And I'll be honest with you. I don't know why anybody would be flying L.A. workout. Miami's a much, you know, closer city. You, you know, it's either, either a three and a half hour drive or a 45 minute flight. So Spencer Denwitty, you know, get some game. You know, that's all I got to say. <laughs> Showing up for the local, yes. local businesses. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> right on. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I just keep thinking about the whole, like, when I tr used to be learning how to bring my own bags into the grocery store and how often I would forget them and have to, like, go back and get them before I came back in. And I feel like we're all trying to, like, train ourselves to use masks right now. So like, I appreciate the like, no, we really need you guys to have them on even when you're talking, you know, even when there aren't a bunch of people around just to drill into our heads. Like this is what we really need to do. And we need to be serious about it and take, take it, take it seriously. But that having been said, this whole thing happening in a bubble with a snitch line <laughs> makes it hard to take it too seriously. <laughs> I agree. I appreciate what the NBA has done. Adam Silver has Adam Silver has done an amazing job at putting this together, getting with the players union and figuring out how to work this out. Like I said, I was skeptical at first. I didn't know how I was going to take it. I didn't really want them to play, but just seeing what they've been able to come up with is very beautiful to see. And hopefully the NFL can kind of follow suit, but Roger Goodell and Adam Silver are two different, totally different commissioners in my opinion. I love Adam Silver. That's why I love watching the NBA. People's and the champ. Growth, yeah, and the growth of the NBA. Roger Goodell just seems too stiff for me at times. Adam Silver listens to his players and what his players want and what they need. He also listens to the fans and takes everything that we say into consideration as well. I also want to uh, point this out before we go. The NBA is going to do, like, I think Black-owned businesses, I think around the uh, Orlando area to cater to the – NBA players and they're bringing in a barbershop. So they're bringing in some of that 2K feel into the NBA. And I like that because a lot of players play 2K. I like that they're incorporating that video game atmosphere with the players because they really enjoy doing those things. Amber, I think it was minority owned uh, catering services and they were looking yes. to get minority owned other small businesses involved in the bubble also. Yes. I think that'll be beautiful. That's beautiful. I agree. Yeah, and I'm and really glad they're doing that. And as for me, I had my reservations about the bubble, and I thought that the NBA had no business of playing. But now, just seeing, seeing the process, and you know, the rapid testing, and even the even the snitch line, okay, you know, seeing how how it contributes to the the early success of the bubble, you know, I kind of feel, you know, hopeful. You know, still kind of hesitant, but hopeful that this thing will work out. As far as the NFL goes, they are tone deaf and they will remain tone deaf. And they've been tone deaf for years. And, you know, the golf on a tangent here, I think that the players should strike. This time the strike would mean something because it ain't like they could get replacement players as easy as they did in 1987. But that's another show for another day and for another sport. I agree. I and agree. I, I love watching football, but when you watch it, you just see it. It's just kind of like there's the huge difference in the NBA players and the NFL players. It's just a big difference. Even the, even the free agency is different. And it took them like, you know, until 1992 to get the free agency that kind of looked like something. Back, uh, before that, it was either plan A or plan B. They don't have that anymore. And they Reggie still have Reggie White. Play. Yeah. Exactly. Reggie White was the first free agent in the NFL in 1992. Exactly. Yeah. And that was the that was the first, you know. I mean, it was kind of a win for them, but when you compare them to the NBA, it's not even close. Because the NBA have leadership that cares and a solid players union. The NFL don't have that. 
the, the NFL is a hot mess. Hey, Janelle, I didn't want to introduce a new topic just before signing off, but I wanted to get your thoughts on something. We are extending the season out, which means we're not starting next season until probably Christmas. What are your thoughts? I think the thoughts, I kind of like that. I'm warming up to the idea because, you know, originally football would be winding up and Christmas is where everybody pays attention to the NBA. All eyes are on the NBA. So, it, it, you know, I'm kind of warming up to the idea. But, you know, the NFL, if they start, they're thinking about starting in January and having a May Super Bowl. And there goes the NBA shot at, you know, having some decent ratings. So it's, it's something. And, you know, also to piggyback off of that, if the NBA starts later, you know the Olympics are in July next year. So they're going to have to try to figure that out. When are the finals going to be? Because if you have the Olympics in July, that's not that's a quicker turnaround than, you know, having it the finals in June, you got to go right to July and go to the Olympics. So if you're playing in the finals, you might not go to the Olympics. I don't know how that's going to work. I don't know how far they're going to stretch the season. They want to cut the back-to-backs. You know, they're starting to cut those back-to-backs, but they're going to have to have more back-to-backs if you want the season to get done in June. I'm trying to see how they can get their season done in June in order for these players to get ready for the Olympics because they go to Vegas, they play in those games, and then they get ready to go to the Olympics. So I'm eager to see how they match that schedule up since they're going to the Olympics in July, going to Tokyo in 2021. That's going to be very interesting to see. Well, any any part and shots? Any no, let part? the chaos begin. Yes, let's go. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's go. I, I, am, I am getting excited for it, and I'm just excited about covering it all in real times. And I appreciate all three of y'all for joining me for this pilot episode of I Got More. It's been a pleasure. Y'all are very insightful and informative, and you know I'm I'm just I'm just hyped right now. I'm I'm just excited for for everything, and I appreciate this for real. Thanks for having us on. Yeah, thanks thank for the you. opportunity. No, I appreciate it. Yeah, no, no appreciate problem. It. And, and you're welcome to come on anytime. <laughs> anytime. Appreciate that. Appreciate it. Appreciate well, it. This concludes our the pilot episode of I Got More. Join me every Thursday as we talk about the latest trends and news around the NBA. Thank you for watching. Thank you for for listening. Have a good one.